this baby hits 88 miles per hour, you're gonna see some serious shit. Wake up. Time to die. Good morning, Angel. Good morning, Charlie. Yo, she bitch. Let's go. I'm on, Dad. You're so fast, too. Don't fuck with the babysitter. We came, we saw, we kicked it ass. Swing. Yeah, baby. <laughs> Bueller. You can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Oh, oh. What are you looking at, Spothead? Fucking Chuck Norris. Great Scott, my dog is heavy. You just gotta keep living, man. L I V I N. Cinema Royale. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? <sighs> Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Hello, and welcome again to Cinema Royale, where we talk about movies in the Ring of Royale at the round table of discussion. I'm your host, Mike, and let me introduce you to my fellow film aficionados. First up, we have James Sullivan, also known as Jaime Tude. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by... Who do you gotta screw to get more views on Review Utopia? <laughs> you couldn't quote like the deleted scene from the producers, or, like the deleted song, but let's not go too far. Kids are watching. <laughs> ah. <laughs> and as you may have heard, that was the ever clever Matt Brunei, also known as Animat. And uh, this podcast is also brought to you by edpshop.spreadshirt.com. I have officially opened a uh, Electric Dragon Production store where you can buy all great products of animation look back and animatic reviews. Boom! Go there now. Yay. Stop listening to this. Go buy a shirt. All right. I've already got my I've already got my Happy Rainbow Butterfly Pony T-shirt. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Yay. Yay, let's go shopping. And last, but not least, we have Morgan Ledger. Hey gang, this broadcast is brought to you by a non-profit public service announcement to all moviegoers out there. Don't be like me. Avoid that's my boy like the plague. True that. True that. Oh, please. Avoid a fly boy? What? Avoid that's my boy. My boy. Now that's my boy. The Enough said. Enough said. Moving on. This. Enough said, my boy. <laughs> it, it, trust me, you don't want to see this. I've been on a binge of bad movies, and that's the worst of a bunch so far. It is the worst. I've seen it myself, sadly enough. Oh man. And the you don't have any great to punch. Just the last thing. The funny thing about that movie is my oh, mom man. my mom actually oh, likes it. Yeah. Uh, so man, yeah. If you think the Cheshire Cat is bad, you gotta try see. listening to something that's equivalent. Well, let, let me be honest. Uh, I mean, our parents do tend to like weird things. Like, for example, my parents, uh, they went to go see The Lone Ranger and they really liked it. I mean, Sure, it's a cop-out of, like, Pirates of the Caribbean, but it's a cop-out of Pirates of the Caribbean. I guess they found its time. You're not the only one. My mother, my sister, and a friend of theirs enjoyed that well, but the problem was I was working at Big Lots that day, so I didn't get the chance to see it. Uh, 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 Be glad your folks don't have a good appreciation for Medea movies. Ah, uh, jeez. Before, before we extremely go off-topic... Uh, let's get into the episode itself. Um, this episode's been an attempt to record three times, and three weeks later, and here we are. It's, long story short, my internet's been crappy, now it's finally fucking working. Hoorah! And this episode is gonna be all about the film noir. Yes, film noir is the, uh, genre that actually... I'm not shitting you, the film aficionados are not sure if it's a real genre, it's still debating, but film noir is the uh, 
genre of films back in the good old black and white era. And most of them are depicted as uh, crime fiction. You know, they come, there's, there's a hard boiled detective and. <clears throat> it's all that good stuff. Yeah. It, it's... Yeah, if I can add in, film noir is basically the kind of, like, from my research, film noir is basically this big, it's a big, it's like a big thing of a genre that, where, uh, it, it's not really more of a genre, but it could be, like, a bit of a, a, a writing medium, because essentially what film noir is, is pretty much, um, at the beginning, you have this crime that's been committed, and uh, like whether it be a murder or robbery or anything or something that happened and basically the plot afterwards is that you got this one person who wants to um, put justice to the person who committed the crime or um, who wants to avenge or something like that and that that, that's basically the genre so like with that said um you could pretty much you could pretty much think of any like any movie that you have seen and you could consider it a film noir like when i learned that like I, it just clicked to my mind that i've seen a, i must have seen a lot of uh, film noir movies yeah mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. well here's a question that we need to get off the bed uh, right off. Uh, we need to get answered right off the bat here i think and that is, uh, is film noir specifically detective stories, or are detective stories specifically film noir? Am I making any sense? Uh, well, yeah, I see where you're going with it. I would say, I would say uh, the latter. Detective stories have to be film noir because what I just said is pretty much like. I just pretty much made a synopsis of all film noir movies. It's basically there's this crime, like you have a crime committed, and you got then afterwards you got this one person who wants to solve the crime or avenge the crime. Yeah, yeah. And that's Matt. basically what film noir is. That that could pretty much be anything. And because detective stories are pretty much like they have to go through this. It's pretty much what it, this is pretty much what they. They have to follow that plot, so it's more of the detectives have to be a film noir. Yeah. Mm. I think I can follow that, that up with sort of an example, even though I don't like this movie. Um, Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo can be pinpointed as sort of a take of noir, because you do have the character that Jimmy Stewart's playing, even though he has a bit of a crutch, which is Vertigo, and he sort of has this situation that he's investigating, looking out for, and then as he goes along the plot line of the narrative, he starts getting all these clues and hints getting tossed out at him. And then not long before, it's until later, later on, something clicks into his head. And that's when everything sort of kicks in. And it's sort of the basic gist of a new wire. Villains get their just desserts, while others who figure out the case go on to something bigger, or they're just left in a depressing mood. James, just like the detective... Oh, yes, we, uh, we, uh, uh, Morgan and I did a a little bit of research for this episode, um, just last night. Uh, we watched a little movie. Huh? Of course. Homework, that's cool. Uh, we watched a little movie called The Detective with uh, uh, Frank Sinatra, uh, starring, uh, he's playing uh, Joe Leland, a middle-aged uh, uh, lieutenant who's uh, looking to get a, a raise and investigates the murder of a local gay man. A local gay man? A yes, local gay right. man. Like homosexual gay? Or? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> oh, God. Uh, that, 
And he appeared to be very, very happy. <clears throat> Hear that every day. <laughs> but um No, because you make, it sound, well, you make it sound like a like a like a job, you know? It's like local gay man. It's like it's like people from the village. It's like you got your blacksmith, you got your the village idiot, then you got the gay man. <laughs> And here's the town gay over here. Um, now, normally we would, I would not just, you know, bring that up and 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 staple that. Uh, but the film, uh, considering the film in question, uh, it makes it such a big deal. Um, you know, the the whole, I, I, the whole reason behind uh, uh, this film being made was that it was trying to deal with the tab the then taboo uh, subject of homosexuality and um, it presses on it so much so so much that it's it it becomes uh, it, it it becomes the uh, the reefer madness of homosexual uh, propaganda I think it's pretty much the equivalency of putting your hand in under the a panini end. press. It's pretty much the equivalency of putting your hand under a panini press and just shoving it right down on there. It's sort of like literally forcing it right onto you. It's just for 1968. This didn't really live up pretty well, and even that year it gave us Planet of the Apes. I mean, seriously, we're talking about like scenes where we see a group of people having like weird get together orgies and like back truck warehouses and stuff like that. It's just ugh. This was made in, in that was made in 1968. Yeah, I, mean, I can understand like 1968, when, like in the 40s or 50s. Yeah, in, I can understand during the 40s and 50s when uh, homosexuality was a really like a don't go there kind of subject. But 68, it's like it's a little late. That's when people are starting. I, I think isn't that like when. Homosexuality is starting to open up a bit, don't you think? Well, I don't know. Maybe the book was made two years later. Yeah. Like, I don't know. 60... Yeah, that's what I thought. It's like it's like it's starting to. Uh, it's like that's when open like being sexuality is starting to be a bit okay. Like, I don't know. Making like a propaganda say no to. Uh, hom- homosexuality during that time it's like are you like this sounds like you're going a little bit like that's a little bit like it sounds like you're just being angry for the sake of being angry it it didn't come out and say and specifically say say no to homosexuality however there were some there were some uh, certain uh, implications in there about uh, about uh, the gay communities and uh, I with all this all due respect um, I uh, I do have a I do have an uncle removed who uh, actually is a member of the gay community uh, well, nearby um, and uh, I think he would probably fit right in with the, the crowd of some of these people that were in this film but um, the problem is, uh, I, I, the the implication that the film comes to in the end is uh, if you if you struggle with your homosexuality, or your if you're gender confused or whatnot, you may actually kill somebody. Oh. I'm or not even kidding. Of, or, or in the case of Bob Cadgold Plate, you will explode. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention briefly to the listeners that the detective was in 68, and that clarifies as a neo-noir film, which takes place after the film noir era, because film noir was in the 40s and 50s. And in the 60s, you know, they started out a new set of subgenre called neo-noir, and it's still going on now where they're kind of taking elements from the film noir and 
improving it, adding their own elements to it, and making it's got the same kind of thing going for it. Like well, pretty much have the same feel, but not necessarily have the detective story. Yeah, some sometimes there'd be detective stories, but then there'd be other kind of you know, similar stories they they can make it, make into. I will say I will say a few uh, uh, two things that I I did actually appreciate about the detective that uh, stopped me from uh, uh, disliking it or completely disliking it altogether. Uh, okay. One one is the treatment of the other taboo subject to the film, uh, Joe Le- Joe Leland's relationship with his wife, uh, being uh, that she's uh, very sexually active uh, bec- uh, due to a, a, a clinical psychological reason. I thought that I thought that that was actually fairly well depicted and treated in the film. And uh, two, uh, if you don't. If you, even if you don't like uh, the film at the end of the day, uh, you can... Uh, uh, here's the fun fact about it. The sequel, there was actually a, a sequel book, which I'm holding right now, Nothing Lasts Forever. And they made this into a movie, but you guys, uh, I'll take a guess at what the movie was called. Die Hard. I'm keep- Bingo. Cheater. Yeah, I, I actually I knew that fact because I'm a huge Die Hard fan, so. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Mm. Is actually. Is, wait a minute. Is like the prequel to Die Hard? Is that what I'm getting? The detective is. Uh, well, I should say Die Hard is more, say, more so the spiritual successor to the detective. Yes. It. Um, <laughs> It is based on the book, yes. Yes. Actually, it James is... Van this further, because originally, um, Nothing Lasts Forever was going to be, was going to, was written so it could turn to a film, but unfortunately, Frank's not just declined, and so they changed what they had with the book into a sequel to the Arnold Schwarzenegger film Commando, but then he turned down the role and, okay, now I can see where this goes. Never mind. Mm-hmm. So then it turned into Die Hard, so I apologize. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, it's got to yeah. be... Yeah. I'm quite aware of all that. It's, it's a great history lesson for those film officiados out there. I, I just blew my mind when I found that. I was like, what? That's awesome. I'm... That's pretty weird. There you go. Okay, so uh, noir and neo noir. Yeah. Um. Some genre, eh? <laughs> what kind of genre would that be? Um, I was gonna say that. I mean, for me personally, my experience, I've seen bits and pieces of film noir i mean i know the style i know you know how it goes and you know it's pretty typical i just love the detective stories because you know it's always interesting how they solve the crime and with neo-noir you know it's that's my kind of feel because i love the films that adapt it in the 60s and 70s and so forth and my god the 70s had a good chunk of movies. Uh, I care to take in the the movie which spawned it a, another genre of films pretty much, which we might talk about in the next in a future episode. And that movie would be Shaft. <laughs> Shaft. Can you dig it? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, it takes 
the detective story to a whole nother le- level. You know, he's a black detective and he's trying to be this badass, you know. And it started off the black exploitation genre, which featured all the blacks playing, you know, detectives, these badass um, people. And, then, and everybody and then was killed by the Wiz. <laughs> yeah, yeah. True story. Yeah, it is. We'll talk about that in the episode. Um, I just like to bring that up because Shaft is iconic. You cannot think about a film that includes detectives without thinking about Shaft. It was even remade re- remade with Samuel L. Jackson playing the role as Shaft. It's so I- iconic. Well, if you go back even farther uh, than Shaft, you'll find that uh, the black exploitation genre, uh, most actually, I think most historians will uh, will probably agree that it was before Shaft. There was a film uh, uh, made by uh, Melvin Van Peebles uh, entitled "Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song." Oh. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're right, you're right, you're right. I'm, I probably messed that up. Um, yeah, but that, we're getting into a little bit of black exploitation now, and that's not really called as a neo-noir film. Yeah, but yeah. Well, Shaft was... was so... Uh, yeah, uh, to go to your point, though, Shaft was initially going to uh, actually be... A standard white detective up until that point uh, the success of sweets of sweetback was what uh, producers uh, turn producers said and said you know what this needs you need to be black yeah oh yeah mm. so Um, are you, uh, is, is somebody mixing up a nice, uh, a nice cold mocha over there? <laughs> Save me one. Yeah, I don't know who's, yes. who's that Save is. Save me some chocolate. Um, like I said, Neo Noir featured a lot of films that took elements from film noir, and... There's another kind of subgenre from that, which Morgan might agree with me. It's the science fiction noir, and that one Ooh. movie is Blade Runner. It's actually more than Blade Runner, but I guess we could stick with that. It's more than that, but I, I think the most iconic one is Blade Runner, in my opinion. Mm. Mm-hmm. It took mm-hmm. it took the detective story into the future and it made it created a nice slew of you know this atmosphere this this universe to embrace and like oh wow this is what's going to happen in the future maybe kind of thing but yet fictional well, it, it, it's kind of just that. I mean, the whole idea of taking this futuristic world and making it grim and grimy and, again, sort of along the lines of a detective story, when you look at that film, you see Los Angeles in a very dark aspect. There's a lot of um, bleak color palettes. There's a lot of rain going on. It has this very smoky exterior, which in a way sort of gives it that black and white kind of motif. That's what makes the cinematography of Blade Runner so interesting, because you're seeing this futuristic 1930s, 1940s kind of perception, and the story itself, you can consider it a bit of noir. I mean, you are following this character who's a bounty hunter, per se, Mm -hmm. and he's basically hunting down what else? Possibly his own kind, not to give too much away, but just the whole idea of this reluctant hero going in to do this, you know, last-minute job really does reflect the classic times of the Maltese Falcon or any of those classic 30s and 40s films. Um, another science fiction classic, well, actually another cult classic, I should say, um, 
is the movie Gattaca, which in a way has some themes of noir as well, where you have this person who's generically created, who's trying to hunt down this person that was born naturally, hiding in a world of people that are just generically created, and he's the target of investigation. And in a way, you could argue that a lot of those themes are carried over from the past detective films as well. And by the way, I must say, Gattaca, it's a very, very underrated film, especially considering the concept of being a natural-born person lost in a world of people that were literally made chromosome wise via digital yeah yeah just out of curiosity would um my robot be considered a, sci- a sci-fi noir yes yeah because like i'm not much on like i'll be honest here i don't really know a lot about film noir itself, like during the period of the 1940s and the 1950s, I do know a lot of uh, some of the, uh, a lot of the noir, and like, not even sci-fi noir, that's what, I, that's what I was thinking, like, I'll be honest here, I haven't really seen Blade Runner or Gattaca, but like, that's why, like, it popped up in my head, because like, when um, I robot be considered one, because like, technically, like, you've got Will Smith as a detective, trying to investigate all these robots. Oh, yeah. You know, you're probably right. Yeah. It, it, I hadn't thought of that. I, 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 if, you're, if you're going to go by the definition saying that uh, noir stories involve de- detectives or vice versa, then, uh, uh, then, then yeah... Um, I robot it is probably a, a neo noir, albeit uh, it's it's debatable the quality of the film. Yeah, it's very debatable. Yeah, but we could all we we as a group can safely say it, it could might as well be. Um, there are also yeah. It it has the story structure of a film noir. Theoretically, even though like it is more of an it is more of an action film, and like they're trying to put emphasis on the on the computer graphics that they do, like the CGI on the uh, on the robots and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And mostly, like they're, they're putting emphasis on the future aspect. But you know, but it's more like I would say it it, it could be film more because of how it's. Uh, how, how it's built up as a story. Yeah, it could be. Um, I was just going to say, there's been a lot of parodies of the film noir. You know, they kind of parody the genre, you know, the style of it and the look of it. And um, one of the most notable ones that I can think of, and Matt might be keen to talk about it too a little bit, is Robert Zemeckis' uh, Who Framed Roger, R- Roger Rabbit? <gasps> oh, boy. oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I knew that was going to be brought up. That is one of the few. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the movie. Alright. Uh. Yeah. Like. Um. Like, I would say, well, I'm not, fully, like, even though, yes, it does have a detective, um, I'm not entirely, like, it could probably be a film noir, but, like, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to say yes full on, because theoretically, there's a lot of things going on, because, like, it's not just, like, Eddie Valiant trying to solve this case, like, uh, like trying to solve the case of who killed Marvin Acme, but this is also mm-hmm. like this is all also more like um, more like a buddy cop thing. Yeah. Well, it's like it's more of a buddy cop because technically, like Eddie Valiant is with Roger Rabbit and stuff like that. And yeah. Like what it is in a whole, it's technically a tribute. Part to the um, to all the cartoons and the animated films 
uh, during the the thirties all the way to the fifties, and like it's the infamous crossover between all the cartoons of uh, Tex Avery, Warner Brothers, Disney, GM, and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, so it's mostly a, like mostly it is. It's more of an homage to. Uh, it's more. It's an homage to the classic cartoons more than it is film noir. But I will admit, like, I don't know if we still want to talk about Roger Rabbit, but it does bring a new question. Would Buddy Cop films be considered a film noir film? Well, film noir, like, Buddy Cops be, like, would the, uh, Okay, hold on. I can get this. Would Buddy Cop films be considered in the, in the film noir genre as much as detective movies would be considered in the film noir genre? Well, uh, well, the thing is with film noir. Besides the story of the, you know, the detective and or police officer and or you know this crime drama police procedural whatever, it's got to have this like film noir has a style of you know the filmmaking you know it's got it's you know the undertones in the cinematography and it's not just the story in general. And it's the way how it's portrayed in the film, like the, like Morgan was talking about with Blade Runner had its colors, it was murky, and it was kind of portraying the film noir, you know, because film noir was kind of dirty and it was black, of course it was black and white, but you know it had this dark undertones. But he caught films, which we'll go elaborate in another episode, but briefly, mm-hmm. but he caught films are just pretty much the generic. You know, um, crime film, which has a. Yeah. It doesn't take the elements of film noir. I mean, there might as well be a buddy cop film that might have influence on film noir, but I personally have not seen anything like that. Yeah, that's that's probably where I would go with. with um, that's where I would go with Who Framed Roger Rabbit. It's. Uh, I would say it's more of a buddy cop film than anything because Eddie Valiant is technically solving the case with Roger Rabbit. And, like, with the detective things and all that stuff, it does have a bit of a heavy influence to film noir. So the answer is pretty much, is Who Framed Roger Rabbit a a film noir movie? i say just maybe, but not quite. Yeah. I mean, I brought it up because... It does. It develops this noir plot in the 1940s LA, while there's a host of cartoon characters in the mix of it. It's pretty much one of the most popular um, detective movies in today in today's age, in the modern age, pretty much. Because like nowadays we don't we don't really have a lot of detective films, at, like as we know it with the the black and white like guy with a big coat and a fedora trying to solve cases. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but, you know, times have changed like that because that's not the definite... I mean, that back then, you know, when you think of detective, you think of the trench coat, and you think of the f- style of the 40s and 50s. Nowadays, it's just... it's a There's a modern take of becoming a detective and solving crimes, you know? And, um... You know, and neo-noir, you know, they take the concepts of film noir and they do it their own way. Um, you know, and I'm looking at the list of noir, neo-noir titles, uh, movies in general, and I mentioned this before in the past, but in, um, just imagine Batman. Batman is a, a detective in a way, but he's a superhero as well. Mm. Because technically, um, you're, you're going with the Tim Burton movie, right? Yeah. Yeah, because technically there could be a bit, like, like if you go with the film noir theory, then it could be considered a film noir film because Batman is, like, there is a part of Batman that wants to avenge his parents because he died from, uh, uh, because he died because Jack Nicholson should shoot him off, which he later on becomes the Joker. In that sense, it could be film noir. 
but because it is Batman, people would would immediate like like as a reflex would put it as a um, as a superhero movie more than an actual film noir film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 and and that's the thing with um, I'm just mentioning this because you know. And you keep you keep doing this, man, and I, and I understand why. Um, film noir is the films from the 40s and 50s, black and white era. Anything from six, 1960 until now is called neo-noir, and they just take elements from the previous films and try to adapt into their own films. <clears throat> With that, I mean, there's one film Very noir... Right. I don't know, I'm just saying that. Just to clarify the confusion that might be caused of it. Um, I will go back to film noir in general, because talk- I was talking about neo-noir. I will go back. There was one film noir film that everyone, and I mean every fucking buddy has seen. <laughs> and I'm talking about Citizen Kane. Yeah. This genre of... This topic in general is hard to talk about because the definition of film noir is very tricky because there's a problem with the definition of film noir. And... In fact, this podcast, like, in fact, our internet won't allow us to even go into any depth of length about discussing it. Exactly. I guess Skype's telling me, like, you can't talk about film noir today. Let me, let me ask this, everyone. Has anyone seen Citizen Kane? I'll be honest, not really, actually. <laughs> okay, then we can't talk about it, considering that I feel like it has the ability of being somewhat close to a noir for its style and storyline. You have a reporter that is going after these people, asking what kind of person is Citizen Kane, what kind of person is um, this rich millionaire. And the thing is, it's supposed to be, I guess, some sort of a narrative or some Orson Welles kind of film, which I will admit is pretty good. But the way they delve into the whole scene with this human is sort of like, it definitely takes on this very detective stylized kind of story. And that's what makes this interesting out of the Wells kind of films, with the exception of Touch of Evil. Because it's looking into this person's life and literally piecing together what kind of character he was. Was he someone that was in it just for the wealth of it all? Was he in it because he wanted the thrills of life? Or was it simply because... He was just missing that one thing that he was looking for, and that is pretty much summed up pretty well at the end when all the clues come into place like a jigsaw puzzle. And that's, to be honest, what a noir film yeah. should be, in my opinion. You know, I actually wanted, I don't know if it would count, but I wanted to talk about, um, I, wa- I wanted to talk about LA, like, L.A. Noir also. I don't know if that would count, but technically. That is like I know it's a game and it's not a movie, but that is like legit. Uh, um, that is legit film film noir. Yeah. And it and it is more plot plot oriented than actual gameplay, so it's more a bit. It's a bit of a cinematic kind of game. Yeah. Anyways, what I, I wanted to talk about. Um, I don't know if you know this, Garfield's Babes and Bullets. Yes. Yes. I want. I actually wanted to, like, that is, like, that's pretty much the closest thing. Like, even though it's just a TV special, that's, like, um, really, that's legit film noir in the style of the classic 60s, like, 40s and uh, 50s. And personally, that's my favorite Garfield special. I think it's, like, the best one. Oh, it's the funny thing you mentioned about that, because, um, as you may, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, Bullets and Babes was a part of the um, the book slash of Garfield's His Nine Lives. And it's a book of, you know, talking about Garfield's all, all his nine lives and one of his nine lives. That was one of the original nine lives? Yes. Like, I've seen yes. this, the hour special, but... Yeah, and that's, that's... A, and that's the thing. It wasn't... Uh, um, oh! It wasn't oh, featured in the special, but it was in the... Hold on. Let me... I'm trying to remember which one it was replaced by i'm trying to think of it i can't think of it at the time but oh, it's got okay, a f- no, I, okay yeah sounds familiar ah uh, wait i just wanted to because um 
Yeah, it's the book has all his, is all nine lives, and one of his nine lives was him being Sam Spade, which is the private investigator yeah. in in the film noir era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I I love that story actually. That's one of one of my favorite uh, of his nine lives. Um. And I did that is one hundred percent film noir. Uh, it was the only uh, time in the Garfield storyline in which Garfield actually got laid. And uh, right after I said that, uh, we cut out, and I thought that you uh, guys were doing an awkward silence there for a second. No, I I was going to say that, yeah, that's the only time in his nine lives where he uh, got laid. Wait, did he... Oh, wait. What? Uh, let me wait. see if... Or also in the special. Um, it's implied. It's implied in the special. Yeah, that's true. Okay, yeah, it's true that in the in the end, it's like, like what what did Garfield say? Like when John opened the door, it's like Garfield, what are you doing? It's like pick up. Let me to my. Uh, leave me alone in my dreams, or something like that. Oh. Or something. Yeah. But my fantasies. Yeah. No, yeah. no so, so pick up audience, at, write down in the comments what was the last line that Garfield said in in uh, Babes and Bullets. There you go. Yeah, that's your uh, secret question. Give me uh, that answer. Um but yeah, it's it's I just love the the concept behind Garfield and his nine lives cuz most of the stories were not adapted because uh the funny thing is is that Garfield's babe, bu- Babes and Bullets is a separate thing. Uh, the other three that were not adapted were The Vikings, Exterminators, and Primal Self. Instead, we get a King Cat in the Garden. Uh, in, the, in the Garden was actually part of the Nine Lives book. Yeah, I remember. Oh, like, shit. Yep, yep, I got it. I got it. Yep, I read it wrong. Hold on. Diana, that was, I remember, like, Hold on. that I was the part of the book. All right, so it was, yeah, we got they put in the, Jazz Cat or something. They put in King Cat, and then, uh, court musician, stunt cat, Diana oh, yes. Piano. Oh, yeah, that, yeah, that was, like, a short gag in the, uh, Yes, briefly, yeah. Yeah, it was like a short gag in the special, wasn't it? it? It's it, it is claimed to be as short as one of his nine lives. But yeah, they didn't adapt four of the original yeah. stories into the special. But we did get ba- Garfield's Babes and Bullets, which is my favorite story. And yes, it is 100% film noir, because uh, in the book, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the... Um, pulp fiction novels that the mo- the movies are based off of. It's got that tone when you read it. Um, I was going to mention briefly, of course, that this topic is really hard to discuss because there's problems with the definition of film noir. I mean, sure, it's the majority of it is all detective stories and the private eye at the cop or whatever, but it's just that it's there's other stuff that goes into it. There's sometimes film noir talks about uh, gangster films. So if you're watching a gangster film, that's a film noir. Um, uh, so, but yeah, back in the day, they were uh, called melodramas. Not film noir. Noir just came into picture later. Um, what was? I, wasn't there any any? Uh, I'm trying to think, what what was? What's one movie that we can end off with? Sin City. Yes. Oh, I forgot. I was about to say that. There you go. Um, and I uh, Neo. Just yeah, Sin City. Yep, there you go. We can end with this. Sin City is the 
quintessential neo-noir film based off a comic book which depicts film noir-esque traits. Yeah, it was like an original... It was an original comic considered one of the best by legendary comic creator Frank Miller. And essentially, like when it, when it's adapted to a film, it pretty much has its own comic book style, but it does still have that um, film noir feeling to it. And like I said, like he's not really a detective. He just wants to avenge... Like the, on, like, the only shred of purpose that he had in life, which was a girl named Goldie. Bef- before, he was like a total wreck. Like, he had no purpose. He didn't care about anything. And then Goldie pretty much showed him the ways. And pretty much that began something new to him. And when that was taken off, he d- he wanted revenge, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're thinking of specifically Mars storyline. There's multiple storylines in the film. Yeah, that's what you're thinking of. One of which actually does have a have a detective played by Bruce Willis. Oh, okay. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I forgot about that. It's been a while since I've seen Sin City, and I got I just, I probably got a little too excited because of that one part. But... You could go on. It's cool. It's it's cool. It uh, I mean, like we've said before, you don't need. It doesn't need to be uh, uh, a detective story in order to be a noir. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. Yes. You just need so, a crime and a reason for a revenge or to solve the crime. Yeah, Marv's uh, Marv's story alone, uh, not just because of how of how dark it is, but also the story that it uh, that it entails. Um, it yeah, it's, it it definitely qualifies as noir, and I understand that uh, Frank Miller tried to follow that up with a, a film that I'm very uh, you mean uh a comic? very afraid to mention uh do you mean a comic I'm, or it was a film uh oh mhm but there should be a, a there's still a sin city too uh in the works yes yes a dame to kill for so look out for that fucking film. Yeah, isn't that mm-hmm. like with Johnny Depp as well? Like, I think he was rumored to be one of the cast at one point. That would actually not be so bad. I think yeah, it'll give some. It'll give Johnny something new to do. Other than. Uh... Yeah, other than um, um, so let's see the the sequel. Let's see. Uh, apparently, let's see Johnny Depp. Johnny Depp. I don't see any Johnny Depp related well, stuff. Well, at one point, at one point. Well, no, you're not gonna see him in the movie. Okay. Oh. Nope. Well, at one point, he was considered. I remember it was yeah. on his. Uh, uh, it was on his list. I'm, I wasn't crazy. Uh, yes, you were. You're back to the same. I wasn't. <laughs> I swear, I saw him. <laughs> you crazy bastard! You're making up lies, rumors. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> but yes, also- um. Disney movie directed by Tim Burton. <laughs> but yes, uh, Sin City is getting a sequel called Sin City: A Dame to Kill For. It's going to come out next year. Already? Yes, it, the release date's been pushed back to uh, August twenty second, twenty fourteen. Mm. It was supposed to be released this year, but it got pushed back. All right. All right. 
But yeah, so uh, they were making room for 302 or whatever that is. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking 300. I saw that trailer for that one. Oh. Uh, why? Because monies. <laughs> of course. Monies and this is Sparta kicks. Um. <laughs> this, this is, is Spartacus. This is Fall 2! <laughs> um, alright, I'll wrap this up here. Alright, um, so, yeah. It's film noir is a tough topic to talk about, and we tried to attempt it, even though we had some difficulties recording this episode as you are hearing this. Um, so. I am going to quickly do this before my internet goes a little crappy on me. Let's just get this done over with. Let's find out what the next episode is. Uh, that good old dartboard. <laughs> that good old dartboard. You got something? You got something? You're, you're, you like, you're like, a, like, a, like a OCD squirrel. You got something? You got something? <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's like a kid on the bus. Did you get something yet? Did you get something yet? Did you get something yet? I am checking the board and see if I hit anything. And da, 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 da. what do we got? You know what? This should be a good topic. We've hmm. been talking about American films and a couple of Canadian films. But this time, we're, the main focus for the next episode is Canadian films. Films that were made in Canada. Released by Canada. Oh all, oh all in honor of Matt Brunet. Of his Yay. country. So. Yeah. Uh, broken Lizard. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> With See, that, you <laughs> See you next time on Cinema More Wow. Got it. You see, this is what happened with with um with his uh internet Wi Fi. He got so pissed off that it's all broken, he ended up drinking all the time. And this is what happens. <laughs> I can't believe this shit happened to me. I don't like this anymore. <laughs> I just want. Well, to... Jack I just won't solve the problem. Oh, excuse me. It makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> then, if you're gonna keep on doing this, we should switch the dartboard into something else. Wait a minute. I I I do the dartboard and. It's just fine. <laughs> um, we should give you. We we should probably give you a ball instead. D you you being drunk with darts. That's that's a little dangerous to think about. It's yeah. It's not a real fucking dartboard. It's a magnetic dartboard. It's got these magnet darts. It's 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 very safe. So I'm not gonna hit anybody when I throw it. Either way, when you're drunk, you can still make it dangerous, so I don't trust you with it. Have a, Here's a ball. Now play. You're going to give me blue balls now? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm giving you blue bouncy you. balls. And <laughs> with that... If I, I have one blue ball in this hand and one blue ball in this hand, what do I have? Mike begging for mercy. <laughs> James, you bud out of this. This is not your conversation. <laughs> All right. That has been Cinema Royale. Next episode is Canadian Films. And we'll see if anything related to Ken Canada or anything at all is going to happen. So, uh, good night. Goodbye. See Goodbye. you later, dude. Blue balls. I don't believe this. No.
You, I was just kidding about the blue balls, man. I, 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 I just, I'm just rambling on top of my head, and, uh, and uh, make a read that. <laughs> Hello. Ah, there we go. We got connection. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. So, Mike, how does it feel to have good internet for once in your life? Uh, that's funny. Hey. Uh, hey, hey, Macarena. Macarena. Oi. Oi. Echo. Echo. <laughs> I just hear, yeah, it's like I heard a, like, an echo. Whoa, that's Whoa, major that's echo. Major echo. Reminds me of um, uh, it reminds me of like one Looney Tunes cartoon with Le, 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 Pepe Le Pew. Like the Disney stranger one joke is like I I I love 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 you you you, and then you hear the echo. I love you, I love you, I love you. Pretty good, eh? <laughs> I guess uh, Morgan's uh, not coming in after all, or he... yeah, he's moved to a room. I figure I start the call off and add him in when he's ready. Okay. So we just get our mouth moving a bit and just prep. Yeah. That's sort of motivate the vocals a little bit. Yep, so we're not so dry and... <laughs> yeah, I know mm -hmm. the feeling. Yeah, so... Yeah, so... Or Echo. Or... Hey, Echo gone. So gone. today... Um... Okay, who here really is in desperate need of earphones? Desperate need Nobody? of earphones? Um, uh, to cancel out I the echo? I'm good. Why? You selling some? I mean to cancel out the echo. Oh, to cancel the echo? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't hear it anymore, so... Yeah, I'm just... I think, uh... I see the echo's going yeah. on. I think it's gone now. Yeah. That was weird. Yeah, it comes and goes. Mm -hmm. I went to see a, a concert today for a group called Pink Martinis. Mm, how was it? Um, it was okay. Mainly, I went there just to spend time with the with my sister and my niece. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. Oh. <laughs> you had a good. Time. Yeah, at least you had a good time. Uh. 
Mm-hmm. And what were you guys up to today? I, I was pretty much editing... I was pretty much editing a small video that I uploaded now to announce my new, uh, my new shop. <coughs> oh, 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 oh. <clears throat> I noticed. Interesting, uh, products. <laughs> I mm. might, I might go shopping. Till I drop. Is that going to be our sponsor oh, yeah, for so this evening? I was just thinking about that today. I was just like, you know what? I think Am Matt's going to mention it. He's going to whore out his store. <laughs> this episode this episode's brought to you by Animat's Store. Hey, you saw how I hold out on that video. I'm just having more out of it. <laughs> no, uh, it's like, we're going to talk about film noir, and then suddenly, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, sure. Any value in real really did a good job in solving that case, but he, he would have gone gone solving that case better if he had one of my pins or t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> no, just like, <laughs> it would be like a little commercial in between, like, have you bought your Animat shirt today with the seal of approval? Go to the Electronic Dragon Productions Spreadshirt.com to buy your shirt now. No, it's going to be like in, oh, no, I just realized, it'll be like in, uh, you know in Willy Wonka when they interviewed uh, Violet Beauregard and then like, we see the guy just there. Uh, oops, excuse me. It's like he just grabs the microphone. Hi, friends, Sam Beauregard here. Here with all the fine scars you will ever need. I'll just do, like, randomly doing that, like, while you do, like, I don't know, the intro or you talk one of the movies or something. <laughs> oh, you're killing me. That'd be, that'd be, uh, pretty, be like, what? Mm -hmm. Oh, man. I Let's... still have to see this video. Mm. Mm. I haven't seen the video. I just went to the store directly. You got, let's see, a seal of approval for t-shirts. The actual seal of approval. Happy Rainbow Butterfly Pony. The animat logo. I mean, the animation look back logo. It's All actually right. rainbow butterfly pony flowers. Yeah. It's a reference from uh, one of my an one of my animation lookbacks that everybody apparently loves. That's good. That's good. That's the way you make your money, making references to your videos with a t-shirt. Happy Ow. Rainbow Butterfly Pony Flowers. Uh, I want to thank you for going easy on the Care Bears movie. Yeah, no problem. No problem, man. <laughs> uh, it's the kind of film, yes, it, like, everybody yes is bad, but it's the kind, it's like, if you can't beat them, join them. Like, I actually did sing along at the end of the movie. It's like, we're in the Care Bear family. Yeah. <laughs> I am. I'm smiling ear to ear right now, but you can't see it. Uh, okay. I think there was a, a summer when I was about seven years old. Uh, there was a. I was telling Matt this before. There was a. Or did I, did I, was I telling somebody else? There was a, uh, there was a summer which I would periodically, religiously, day by day, watch uh, the Care Bears movie and switch off from between that and In Wonderland. The third yeah, I was movie. wondering. You also watched, like, the, se the Disappearing Bears sequel and the, uh, the Wonderland movie I never saw the uh, I never saw the cleverly titled movie 2 until I grew up and I was sad to say that I was very disappointed by it uh, yeah I mean, like, I mean like they did that, that Peter Pan thing where like they try to 
make the audience join in. And it's like, come on, everybody. Let's all join together and show that we care. It's like, really, dude? Really? It's like, do I have to? I believe it? it's said the Christ. Oh, fucking care bears. I know what you mean. Nah, but the one thing everybody remembers and loves is the Chris- Christopher Walken impersonation. So I'm shame oh, of disappearing. Wow. So, yeah, actually that actually none of that was my problem with the film. The problem that I had with the film was completely retconning the story of the first film as well as being a rehashing of it. Oh. It oh, no, there was nothing see. original here. Good. Well, unless you count the lot of scenes just <laughs> For me the one that looks Hello. like if I if there's if I ever have to review all the Care Bear movies, the one that I might probably won't go easy on would be the Wonderland one. That looks intolerable. I'm sorry, but it's just that the Cheshire Cat, that Cheshire Cat man. But he was a rapping Cheshire Cat. Exactly, that's my problem. <laughs> I, I, I love it though. Oh, it's, he's so trippy. He, he he's actually putting some passion into his rap. He's so trippy. While he does it, he's like floating spots and all that. Pickle <laughs> You you will okay. It's a guilty pleasure, but you will not guess how many times we have quoted that among, among me and my siblings in our lifetime. Okay. <laughs> they are giant robots. Yuck, 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 yuck. <laughs> you must be excited when you actually see real pickled beets. I was like, what are you serving? Um, today we are, uh, for appetizers, we are serving pickled beets. Now's our chance! Are, are we done? Are we done with the Care Bears talk now? What the fuck? I'm gonna start a new hip hop studio. I'm gonna call myself Pickled Beats Entertainment. Yeah. <laughs> I got an, I got a movie for you. Um, Pickled Beats produced the night the celery stalked. <laughs> It's no longer film noir. We're talking about Care Bears. Yeah, it's the Care Bears episode. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> ah, okay. Hello, My welcome pleasure. To- yeah. Yeah. Okay. Welcome to Cinema Royale, where we talk about Care Bears all the time. <laughs> okay. We're all competing right. with the Brony cast now. <laughs> <laughs> Comedy show, comedy show. <laughs> Alright. No more campers. No more fucking interruptions. Okay. okay. Wow. That's gonna be the funniest outtake I ever heard. <laughs> Wrong fucking button. <laughs> Real professional, Mike. <laughs> Real professional. Okay. Uh, professional. Alright, alright, alright. It, it's yep. it's good, but it, it has these little hiccups, I say, because it just stops for a second, just buffers and disappears. So I had a little hiccup when you left, Matt. Yeah, it shows from your... It shows, like, when you talk on the microphone, actually. Like, when like when you do the podcast, it's like you, 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 you break, break sometimes, you know? Yeah, yeah, I, I notice that too when I do it. It does when it it just breaks because when I this little hiccup comes, I just go. Bleh, bleh, eh, 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 oh. oh yeah. Are you kidding me? Where the hell is Morgan? 
he's not he's on my end my end why is he being this badass now but like i don't want to be in this no more screw you guys i'm a giving him i just we're almost oh, home. Is home actually anybody got time for that Just hold on. See if I can. Um, might want to rephrase that. What? <laughs> oh crap! Wait, sorry. I gotta rephrase that. Uh, you. Come on. Let me try it this way. Wait, let me see that. <laughs> I'm trying to edit it here, so crap. It's out there. I changed it. <laughs> Damn it, I, I'm not good with wording. All right. Hey, you screw this. You screw you guys, I'm going go home. <laughs> Morgan, you fucking this shit. <laughs> Morgan, you fucking this shit. <laughs> oh, this is definitely a keeper. <laughs> it has amazing fuck material. <laughs> Come on, Morgan. Continue. Hold on, I'll be back. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry, I thought I heard something. That was freaky. House is haunted. Um, I don't like uh, crap. <laughs> <laughs> 